can we honor them? Can we, can we do that and say thank you so much? I'm doing the intro. Okay. Well, this is weird. We rarely get to lead worship and then speak. So I'm sorry. If you didn't like worship, you're probably not, it's probably not going to get much better. Because that was the best skill that we have. It goes downhill from here, I, I assure you. Um, yeah, Jenny and I are happy to be here. We're happy to be home. And can I just say this real quick? I have a hair in my mouth. That's not what I want to say. <laughs> That's not what I want to say. But um, we have been to a lot of really giant facilities where churches meet over the past, um, I don't know. Two months. Two months. And let me just say that their buildings are amazing, but it is these small local churches all across the world where the Lord is moving yeah. in miraculous ways in communities that you and I have never heard of. And um, we pray a lot for small and mid-sized churches because I believe that's where the relationships of family, and that's really what the world's looking for is connectedness. So I just want to encourage you guys that God's clearly doing something here at this church every time we come. Um, and I'm a secret spy. I actually watch this service online some weeks. So earlier, like, people come up and introduce myself. I'm like, I've seen you on the camera. And then I realized I sounded super, super <laughs> creeper um, after the fact, which was not my intention. Um, but yeah, so it's been pretty cool. We've been going around. We've been doing these things. And we started an organization called Reboot Recovery um, that helps people overcome trauma. We have three programs, one for veterans, one for first responders, and one for anyone who's gone through trauma. So if that's you and you want to plug in, we've got groups all over. And I think, Lord willing, someday we'll have a group here. We're just waiting on the right time. We have one amen in the back, so we're going to have one participant in that group, and which she is fan she was gonna lead one leader in that group, which is amazing. <laughs> um, and then earlier this year, uh, after doing it for 11 years, we finally released a book because everybody told us we should, and we did, and we have them back there. If you want to buy one, you can. They're 15 bucks, or if you just want to donate what you can, or just if you want one based on what we share today, just take one if you don't have the money. So just they're there back for you. I probably should do a better job selling that, you know. They're amazing. They're worth a fortune, but you can have one for free if you want it. So, anyway, uh, today we're going to be talking about the subject of identity. Hopefully you have not just finished a five-part sermon series on the subject of identity, or else this could be a disaster for the remaining of the morning. Um, so, Jenny, I'm going to kick it to you so that I can stop rambling and stop embarrassing myself further. Jenny Owens, cool. take it away. Well, happy to be here. Thank you. Um, okay, so in 1957, the Indian philosopher Satya Sai Baba said the following, you are not one person but three, the one others think you are, the one you think you are, and the one you really are. But that's the one. The one you really are is the one that we're determined to find this morning. But it's the one that unfortunately gets lost in years of wear and tear. The real you, the one that God designed you to be. But holding on to that identity that God has given us, as we know, can be really difficult. Along the way, we have experiences that knock our identity off its God-given tracks. We have people in our lives that have said things and done things to us that made us feel unloved or unwanted. And certainly a single comment or a one-time action hurts, but when that comment or action is reinforced time and time again, we begin to accept it as truth. And gradually, all of those experiences, the words that are said about us by others, they become our own internal monologue. And those things combine to shape our identities. In other words, the one they thought you were becomes the one you think you are. And it can be nearly impossible to find the one you truly are. Maybe that's where you find yourself this morning. This morning, maybe you don't see yourself as capable, loved, powerful, purposeful. Maybe because of trauma or painful experiences, you feel like a shell of one, who you once were. Your sense of adventure has been replaced by anxiety. Your sense of self-confidence has been replaced by insecurity. Maybe you even started downplaying your God-given gifts and hidden them away, worrying about what others might think. And maybe you've totally lost yourself by chasing the approval of others in your life. Whatever the case, we have good news for you this morning. It's that the true you is in there somewhere, and we want to help you find them. Because listen to this. You are too important to this church. You are too important to God 
to adopt an identity other than the true identity God has given you. Now, you can't erase the past, right? But you can write the future, and yours is a story that is still being written if you're here on this earth, and we're glad that you are. In order to find our true selves, we have to what? We have to speak truth to the lies that we have believed. And in our experiences, we have found that there are three root lies that, if believed, will have enormous influence on how we see ourselves. So what we want to do this morning is attack those three lies head on, one by one, and replace them with the truth. Does that sound like a good plan? Okay, here is the first lie. Awesome. So I'll tell, the, the first lie is this, I am what others think of me. That's the first lie that we buy into, I am what others think of me. So I'll tell a little bit of my story from not reboot related, this is, this is pre kind of God awakening something new in my life. So through a series of really bizarre events, at a very young age, I became the CEO of this technology company in Nashville. And uh, really was totally unprepared for the duty and responsibility of leading this company. Um, but the first couple of years, things went like remarkably well. I think in hindsight, probably in spite of my leadership, but at the time I thought it was because of my leadership. I was like, I'm doing amazing. This is so easy. Anybody can build a business. And it grew and it grew and it grew. And all these you know, employees started moving from other states and working for us and all this amazing stuff happened. And in a matter of two and a half months, we had four clients that for various reasons had to stop working with us and that represented over 65 percent of our annual profit which means that suddenly we went from being one of the fastest growing companies in tennessee to being one of the fastest shrinking companies in middle tennessee facing layoffs having to lay off people that i had just looked them in the eye and told them they were going to move here with their family from california and new york city and chicago and now they had just bought a home here and me saying you don't have a job here anymore was not a very good experience in my life. And, and so much of my identity was wrapped up in me having to be successful. Not just successful in terms of money. that I've never really been motivated by money, actually. Successful more in terms of what other people thought of me. I cared so much what other people thought of me. And it's still something I struggle with today. I'd love to say that I'm immune. But right now, as you all stare at me, I'm nervous that you are not going to like what I have to say this morning. Right? So I still live with that. And I'll remember that, that here's the thing about Satan, is that when Satan finds a path of vulnerability in your life, his goal is to turn that little dirt path into like a five-lane highway. Right? And so here's what began to happen. I remember I was down at the Entrepreneur Center of Nashville, where every single person in the room, if you ask them how their business is going, is going to be like, crushing it, crushing it, man. And you're like, well, 82% of y'all are going to be out of business in a year. And I know that statistically. So not all of us are crushing it. Somebody in here is lying, right? But they have these rooms, these conference rooms that don't have ceilings. I know it's weird. But so it's like you could be in a conference room on the other side of this wall and I can hear what your meeting is saying. Does that make sense? And I was in there and I was so depressed and down and anxious um, that I literally was there trying to hide from my employees. And I wanted to just get away where I could work on something and do emails and try to solve the problem. And I had a whiteboard and I was trying to map out the problem in my head. And meanwhile, I had been battling some really, really dark demons. I was suffering from depression. I had become kind of somewhat dependent on anxiety medications. I had my first suicidal thought. I mean, all these really terrible things were happening. And I'm there and I'm in this point of vulnerability. And I start hearing these two voices on the other side of the wall that were friends of mine. Was it, one was a buddy named LaShawn and another was a guy named Michael. And I... I recognized the voices and I was about to walk around the corner and say, hey, but before I could even set the expo marker down and turn the corner, I heard Michael ask LaShawn, he said, hey, you're friends with the new guy over at, at the company, uh, Center Source, which was the name of the company. And he said, uh, how's things going under the new leadership over these past year and a half? And LaShawn, who's still a good friend of mine, said, pretty good, I think transitions take time. To which Michael said, well, I'm betting it won't be like that for long because from what I can tell from my perspective, the leadership of the company fell pretty far from the tree when it came to CEO material. This guy is widely recognized as one of the most successful and powerful healthcare entrepreneurs in America. And so if Michael thought that of me, he would know better, right? Because he knew what it took. He had been there and done that. And in a moment, I went from already feeling anxious and overwhelmed to feeling hopeless 
and helpless. I felt ashamed. I felt like Icarus. I felt like I had flown too high to the sun on borrowed wings, and now I was melting and being discovered for who I truly was, which was someone who could not lead, but more importantly, would not ever lead again. In other words, I was becoming exactly who he thought that I was. I was letting him tell me my worth. And some of y'all, it may not be a story as dramatic as mine, but some of y'all, when you lay down at night and you shut your eyes, you are still hearing the voices of words and actions and things that were said about you or over you that you're still trying to silence. And right now, if I challenge you, what was one of the most hurtful things that someone ever said to you? I bet all of you could remember it almost word for word. They told you who you were, and you believed them. You took their words, their actions as truth. I get it. But hear me clearly this morning, and I wrote this out here, so I'll read it to you. I said, never let someone who doesn't know your value tell you how much you're worth. Because they may have made you feel worthless, but the Lord says you're worthy. They may have made you feel like a burden, but hear me this morning, you are a blessing. You're a blessing to this family. You're a blessing to your family. You're a blessing to the Lord. So here's the truth. You're not what others think you are, which was the lie. The truth is, you're not what others think you are. You are who God says you are, period, end of sentence. That's the end. With me? Jenny, tell them what lie number two is. All right. So lie number two is I am what I do. So lie number one is we are what others think of us. Line number two is we are what we do. And I believe this is a big one for all of us, especially here in a military community, Clarksville, Hopkinsville. So let me ask you a simple question. It's not something that we reflect on very often, but who are you? It's not something that we spend a lot of time contemplating, but perhaps we should. Because listen, a person who doesn't know who they are will never become who they can be, right? So uncertain on how to answer this question of who am I, we turn to the thing from which we derive the most purpose in our lives. It's the thing where we invest the most of our time, our jobs. Now, when we talk about jobs, we don't solely mean full-time careers. Rather, when we say jobs, let's include anything that consumes a large amount of our time. Could be parenting, could be caregiving or volunteering, whatever. And when we first meet someone, one of the most common questions we ask is what? What do you do for a living? And our goal here is to get to know the person and to try to find something relatable, some common ground that we can build from in that relationship. But behind this question is the very foundation of this lie that we buy into. And it's a lie that leads us to believe that our value is a product of our effort. So think about it this way. The lie says, my actions, what I do, will determine who I am. But the truth says, who I am will determine my actions. You see the difference? But we're all guilty of this. We've all said it and we've all heard it. I'm, I'm a soldier. I'm a mom. I'm a salesperson. I'm a preacher. Essentially, what we're saying is, I want you to know that I have value because I am fill in the blank. And from the get-go, we are seeking approval based on what we can do rather than on who we are. And when we operate, when we live our lives out of this lie, we attempt to substitute the value that's given to us by God at creation with a value that is earned by our own efforts. And that never ends well. And through our work with Reboot Recovery, we spent over a decade working with military families, and this is a lie that unfortunately is taught and reinforced from the first day of basic training. We've seen it cause significant harm, and here's how. It serves us well while we're able to do the profession, right? But what happens when it ends? I worked at the Traumatic Brain Injury Clinic at Fort Campbell, so I was working every day with many soldiers who are walking that line of, am I going to be able to return to duty, or am I going to have to get out medically discharged from the military? So this piece of identity was something that was on the forefront of my conversations and on my mind for the folks that I served. What happens when I can no longer be a soldier? What happens when I take the uniform off the last time? Who am I then? For years, some of you here may have had a patch on your chest or your sleeve that clearly displayed your worth. 
It told everybody that you were a somebody, you had authority, and that you were important. And people, because of that, they treated you a certain way, right? But then all day, one day, it all stops. And if it hasn't stopped yet, it will stop. And some of you are nodding your heads and know exactly what I'm talking about. The day you wake up without that rank, and suddenly you feel untethered, uncertain, maybe even a bit, little bit lost. You aren't treated with that same respect. Your actions in the military no longer seem relevant with the folks that you work with or even with your family members. And now without the rank and the uniform, it all feels a bit aimless. Does that sound familiar? Yes. But it isn't just military. We've seen it so many times. First responders serve 25 years. They maybe retire at 40 years of age or 45 years of age. They wake up without that Superman cape on every, every morning, and they wonder, what is my sense of purpose and direction in this life? Or I'll get personal, the mom whose youngest child, I mean, I'm not to this point in my life, but I'm thinking ahead. Youngest child grows up, moves away. You're sitting alone in a quiet house, and you're wondering, what purpose do I have? What role do I have to play in this world? All of us will experience this one way or another. But listen to this. This is a harsh truth. The belief that we are what we do is in its most boiled down sense, idolatry. It's transforming our own efforts and work into a God that shapes us. Romans 1.25 says, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. And isn't that what we all do with our jobs? We build them, we sacrifice for them, we invest in them, and we trust that they're going to provide for us. We even believe in this strange sense that our job or our identity somehow cares about us, but they don't. Because the minute that you stop feeding into your career, you watch and you see what that career does for you. It moves right on along without you, right? We create these idols and we become slaves to them, serving an abusive master that tells us in our minds, if we put in enough effort, if we put in enough work, it will fill a void that can only be filled by our creator himself. Who I am is not what I do, and it can't be determined by what I do. If I wanna walk in the truth, then who I am has to be based on what Christ did for me, not what I have done for myself. We all need to be reminded of this. Here's this beautiful truth. You couldn't have a rank that's higher than you do right now just by being on this earth. You are the pinnacle of God's creation, and he loves you so much that he sent his son to die in order to save you. Your identity in Christ is not dependent on the accolades that others or your job can just bestow on you. Rather, it's based on the simple fact, the simple fact that God made you and he values what he makes, right? Because of Christ's sacrificial death, you're accepted into God's eternal family. I'm gonna read you a few verses. They won't be on the screen because I don't think we turned them in, but here's, here's who you are, guys. That was her saying I didn't turn them in. That's what that was right there publicly. <laughs> you are... <laughs> chosen by God, holy and without fault in his eyes. That's Ephesians 1.4. You're made just a little lower than the angels and crowned with honor. You're God's workmanship created in Christ to do good works, Ephesians 2.10. You are a new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17. You're part of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people, 1 Peter 2, 9. Awesome. So let's go through. Lie number one was what? You are what others think, what others think you are, or who others say you are. What was lie number two? I am what I do. Anybody identify with either of those lies in their life, by the way? Show of hands. Okay. No, it's just a no, I'm season. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so if those two lies, if they kind of mature, when they become full grown adult lies, yeah. right? <laughs> Now they, they feed into lie number three. Okay, we're getting a little serious here for a minute. All right, lie number three says this. My best days are in the past. My best days are in the past. Some of us, we've been so deeply let down by the opinions of others and by the thing that we had placed our identity in, our jobs, our careers, our life didn't turn out the way that we thought it would, and we face adulthood, 
and we think this is as good as it's ever going to get. For generations, people in cities all across America have sat around reflecting on what they call the good old days. The good old days. You guys know these. These are the stories they tell at family reunions. The big trip, you know, when they went on when they were in high school, that winning touchdown pass, that special deployment they went on that was unlike anything else they'd ever done before, right? And they rehash these same stories and they all tell them as if you've never heard them before. <laughs> right? But Satan, he begins to build off of this uh, good old days narrative, this good old days idea to limit our future potential. In other words, his goal is not just make us to reflect and be proud of our past, but to actually get stuck in it. Because he knows that if we believe that our best days are in the past, then guess what? They probably are. You with me? If we believe that this is, I've done all I can do at this point, it's all just in the rearview mirror now, then that's probably true. Because we will stop striving for a better future. We'll stop reaching for our fullest potential. And when we stop believing towards a better future and stop working towards a better future, we miss out on the greatest gift that God has given us. It's called life. <laughs> and we miss out on it. John 10.10, 10, certainly in this scripture, he's speaking of, of, of life after death, right? I want to acknowledge theologically here. But I still think the principle holds true. It says that Christ has come to give us life, an abundant life. But you see, what does Satan come to do? Steal kill and destroy the very gift of life that God has given us. And he doesn't want to wait just till eternity. He wants to start right now. Part of our work, uh, this is very personal to us. I mean, just yesterday we spent probably an hour and a half, two hours with someone who they were saying all these things to us about their best days are behind them and they've become a burden to their family. And, and um, for, for us, we unfortunately have a front row seat to a lot of people's lives who have battled suicide in their life. And um, I think there's a misconception that people who are suicidal, that they want to die. And that's not been my experience in talking with people who have suicidal thoughts. It's not that they want to die. It's that they're tired of living and they just want the pain to stop. They've seen a picture of of what they believe the future looks like and it doesn't get any better. So they think, what's the point? Why keep fighting if it doesn't improve in the future? I'll just do everybody a favor. I'll end it now. My family will go on. My friends will go on. And they won't have to deal with old Evan anymore weighing them down. This is a topic that uh, hits this community harder than most. This area of Tennessee and Kentucky has much higher than average suicide rates. And that's the reason that the local church, us, are so important. Because God has something different to say about your best days. He shouts out us, actually. You read through Hebrews 11, it talks about that there's a great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, who are cheering us on. There's this picture of an arena in heaven and angels peeking over, watching us, saying, you can do it. You've got Moses there. You've got Elijah there. And they're saying, come on, Evan, you can do it. They're cheering us on. He says, Proverbs 3, 5, when you put your trust in God, not in your own wisdom, he will direct your steps. Philippians 1, 6, to be confident that he'll finish the work he began in your life, that he's still working even when you don't see it. Proverbs 19, that you may have plans in your heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that will prevail. Romans 8, that you're more than a conqueror through him who loves you. Romans 8 again, for we know that all things in God work together for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. You aren't what others think of you or who, you are who God says you are. You aren't what you do. You're what he's done for you. And your best days are not in the past. A little while ago, uh, I don't know, probably about a month and a half ago, I was reading the story of where Jesus heals the blind man. And I love this story partly because every atheist in America knows this story. Right? Because of what? 
Amazing grace, right? I once was blind, but now I see, you know. And I was reading this story, and I'm going to read it to you today because something jumped out to me in this story that is so stupid obvious that I can't believe I never noticed it before. And I don't know, maybe if you guys are going to hear this and be like, that's, yeah, I've always thought that. But for me, it was revelatory, and I'm going to share it with you, if that's okay. I'm going to read John 9, chapter, or chapters 9, verse 1 through 7. As he went along, he saw a man that had been blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who has sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents, said Jesus. This happens so that the work of God may be displayed in him. For as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. For night is coming when no man can work. But he says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with some dirt and some spit, and put it on the man's eyes. (laughs) And then he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And so the man washed and came home seen. I don't know about you guys, but if I had a massive eye infection and was blind, I don't think that I would come home and say, Jenny, feeling a little blind today, spit into my eyes. I don't think I would say that because I would have probably said something back then like, let's get some essential oils, let's rub those on there. Only doTERRA though, you know, none of these other generic brands. Some of y'all, come on now, that's a funny joke. Um, you know, your essential oil people are serious now. How many essential oilers we got in here? We got some essential oil people? Yeah, you guys are serious about that, right? So my point is we would have gotten some lavender, some something, rubbed it on there. But instead, Jesus takes two ingredients that no person ever wants near their eyes. Spit and mud. And it's crazy because these are the ingredients that Jesus uses to help a blind man see. And I started thinking about it. What if all those words that were spoken over you, the traumas you've experienced, the bad experiences you've had in your life, what if that's the mud and spit, and somehow when Jesus comes into your life, he uses those things, were things that you would have never wanted in your life at all, and he uses them to help you see. To see yourself as God sees you. To see yourself for who you truly are are to see a way forward other than suicide to see a way forward in spite of a painful past that's what we are asking for you guys to believe can happen this morning because for some of us We may not want to admit it, but these lies are so deeply entrenched in our lives, and we've believed them for so long, so deeply, that the word of the Lord has to fight to penetrate our hearts. And that's really why I believe Jenny and I are here this morning. I think that might be why we're here on earth, is to simply remind people of who God says they are. This morning, it starts with logic. It starts with breaking agreements. It doesn't start with feelings. It starts with the facts and saying, I'm going to believe the facts that what this person said about me doesn't outweigh what God said about me, that what this career told me I was is not true, that what God did for me is true. It starts with believing those things as truth. It starts with realizing that that spit and mud in your life can somehow be miraculously used to help you see something about yourself, others, and God that you couldn't have seen without it. I was just with a guy yesterday who's been through hell on earth. And he said, you know, I've come to believe that what I thought were the worst days of my life were simply a new beginning. What a beautiful picture. A while back, uh, Jenny and I were reading this book by this guy named Andy Reese, I think it is. And in the book, he had this amazing prayer. And he wrote it out, and he basically said, like, here's what the Lord wants you to know about yourself. And he shared these verses in them. And I thought it would be kind of cool if you guys wanted to just stand with us today. Right now, you guys can stand with us. I thought it would be kind of cool for 
Jenny and I to just read some of these verses over you guys. And then we, since we only did two songs plus two bonus songs at the beginning, I get a bonus song because I don't go here anyway and you don't have to invite me back. <laughs> but the point is, is I thought we would read some of these scriptures and then there's this song that um, we've been listening to a lot. It's, it's called In Jesus' Name, God of Possible. And the song was actually written by a person. She wrote it as a prayer when she was basically paralyzed because she couldn't walk because she had such terrible back problems. And so we thought, you know, I know you don't sing it at this church. Maybe some of you have heard it on the radio. Maybe you haven't. But our thought was maybe we could read these verses and then teach you some of that song maybe as like a blessing over this church and this house. And maybe that's something that we could do today. So if you guys will just close your eyes. I know that some people are going to comfortable with that. So if you need to leave your eyes open, that's okay. But I'll read a couple of them and then Jenny, I'll pass it to you. You may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up, for you were made in my image. You are not a mistake, for all your days are written in my book. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I am not distant and angry, but in the complete expression of love. And it's my desire to lavish my love on you simply because you're my child and I'm your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. I will never stop doing good to you, for you are my treasured possession. I'm able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. When you are brokenhearted, I'm close to you. And one day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes. I am your father and I love you even as I love my son, Jesus. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you and not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me, and nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I've always been father and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I'm waiting for you. <laughs> 